Hi, everyone. Thanks for pushing the button, whoever did. <laughs> Still getting used to the uh, earlier time start here. OK, let's go ahead and start, though. Uh, plan stage weekly. This was just recently changed to, what do we call it now? Plan, plan stage planning? <laughs> plan stage planning for September 2nd, 2020. Uh, I have the first update here. Uh, congratulations to Julian, uh, who is now a full-time front-end engineer on the plan stage. Super excited to have him uh, on the team permanently. So congrats. Over to Mark. Excellent. Thank you. Oh. Congratulations to Julian. Um, yeah, Nick was unable to attend, so he asked me if I could verbalize this for him. Uh, Nick will be transitioning off of the Certify as the designer uh, at the end of 13.4, for those who are not aware. Um, Austin will be transitioning part-time into Support Plan, and Nick and I have been working and will continue to work over the, the course of 13.4 to ensure the smoothest possible transition. But if there's any questions or anything, please you know, reach out to Nick or I, and we'll do our best to you know, address those as they come up. Do you know, is Nick, when you say transition off of plan certify to another group or? Other group. Okay. Yep. So even after that date, he'll still be, he'll still be <laughs> around if we have any questions. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he has a deep requirements knowledge. It'll be a, a hard, uh, hard to replace him, you know, immediately. But he said he's always open to, you know, questions and things. But we are doing our best to transition Austin into a similar position. So that should be hopefully smooth. So then when you say Austin's coming on part-time, uh, does that mean he'll be split between uh, certifying another group? That is my current understanding, yes. Cool. All right, we'll make sure to welcome Austin. Uh, when yes, I started inviting him, but I don't think he could attend this week, so. All righty, uh, over. Someone have a question, comment, or over to Gabe. I just I'm gonna miss you, Nick. If you're watching art. Um, but yeah, the, the next item's mine. I think this is more a big picture update because sometimes it's <clears throat> I don't like pinging everyone all the time because it can be noisy and uh, distracting. So I figured like I'd make a general uh, update here about some of the stuff that's going on uh, in terms of other groups that are contributing to like our stage vision in various ways as there is natural overlap with what these other groups are trying to accomplish. Um, the first one is the health group is uh, using issue types. They were the first group that actually implemented issue types. Um, and they're kind of pushing forward with uh, that for incidents. And then they're also going to be looking at issues uh, like widgets and, and like just generally making things a little bit more extensible. I believe we were talking about using uh, issue types for test cases as well. So that's another like overlap. It's interstage, but still overlapping. Um, but one of the things that I noticed there that would be helpful for us since we're kind of going to own it moving forward is getting the reference architectures right. So those yeah, other groups want to contribute like Greenfield widgets or these things to support their jobs to be done and their use cases that, that it's built in a consistent way that works across all issue types. Like I noticed as it, uh, incidents, we're working on adding a, a widget for severity. They created uh, a, a separate data model and kind of uh, tightly coupled it to uh, incidents. But when I look at things, when when I have like a bug issue type, severity would be a very important like widget or type field to have there. So just to help with that, so I asked Jake to start working with the engineers and putting together some reference architectures for like simple things and complex things and somewhere in between, so that other teams can uh, kind of push the forward, push forward uh, while remaining autonomous uh, and unblocked by us. So that's that. Um, the analytics group, I've been talking with Nick Post, who's the interim product manager there. Uh, they're, they're willing and interested in picking up velocity and adding velocity calculations for iterations, which is something that was on a roadmap that we were gonna do probably after burn down and burn up charts. Um, so they're gonna probably pick that up. And then we also, through that conversation, highlighted that uh, right now, um, since issues can be closed for different reasons, and sometimes it's because they're done, other times it's because they're marked as duplicate, or moved, or just not completed. Um, we need a little bit more flexibility with our issue statuses. 
So also on our roadmap was making issue statuses more extensible and customizable, and they're going to do the first MVC with adding a new uh, close type called result. So you can resolve an issue or you can close it or you can mark it as duplicate. But that will also impact our um, iteration reports and milestone reports and everywhere, anywhere we basically show progress reporting, we'll probably only want to include those issues that have been marked as resolved instead of just the general ones that have been closed. And then uh, yesterday I started talking with the source code group about making reviewers concepts and probably approvals uh, available across all issuables. They're pretty far along with it. And so at some point in the future, we'll probably have to like refactor some of that and work with them to abstract some of the things out that should be shared across all issuables. But there's an increasing ask for, uh, can we have design reviews on issues? Can we have uh, some sort of approval checkpoints when there's a bunch of merge requests that are on staging before we to put, push them to production. Um, that's largely for compliance related uh, organizations or larger enterprises that want to more tightly control for legal reasons or not, um, how issues go through a given workflow. So just saying that's all stuff that's going on that you might not see or you might get pulled into or whatever, but as best as we can support those groups, but also kind of maintain some sort of consistent implementation path so we don't end up with a mess because it can be messy working across many groups. So that's it. On you, John, or unless there's questions. Uh, one question, what's the, do we have an ETA on resolved? Uh, no, although it's labeled as next up and it would be kind of necessary or at least follow quickly with the velocity, which Nick said you'd be able to get to in the next uh, one to two releases. Awesome. So. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, it's a pretty straightforward item. Like Eugenia surfaced this issue. Um, the group sidebar. Uh, we currently do some caching on the project sidebar, and we don't do any on the group sidebar. Um, and things like, in particular, the issue count is quite slow. And it's done in the initial page load, which means that the whole page is quote unquote slow. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask, first of all, if any engineers had context on why we cached the project sidebar and not the group sidebar, are there any blockers that you know of that would stop us just going ahead with this. Um, Jake, I saw you had the item there. Do you want to um, verbalize? Sure, yeah. I mean, Henrik mentioned this, uh, so I take no credit for this knowledge. But uh, I guess the when you the group sidebar, if any, if any change at like a child project, um, you know, that then you have to invalidate all the caches all the way up through. Uh, rather than just having one cache. I think it's a little bit trickier. I think I, I think it's a solvable problem, so I think we should do that. And I think this um, this would be a huge win for both of the kind of like pages that we have as our uh, OKR for performance too, and, and just a general performance win. So we should figure it out and do it. I think it's great. And I'll just verbalize this. I think if it's a smallish fix, we should do it now. Um, one of the things that we're really exploring in the Simplify Groups and Projects Working Group is uh, smashing groups and projects together into one thing yet to be named. Um, largely because I think sometimes uh, we found that stuff, I mean, you can read the problems. I'm not going to go over the problem statement again. But um, we're getting closer on solution validation. And hopefully by the end of this month, uh, we'll be at a point where we kind of know what the implementation path would look like there. But Alex Bully from Manage has been working on that and he's exploring the idea of wrapping uh, what is now a group and project with some thing that would allow all features to be, be available within that thing and then eventually breaking, like refactoring the stuff to pull everything out of groups and projects into this thing and then eventually those would go away. So just if you're interested, you can hop on the working group or there's a Slack channel for it if you want to talk about stuff or brainstorm, we'd love to have input as well. Cool. John, do you have some statistics? How much time does it take, uh, for example, in Kibana? No, uh, not on hand, but I think Eugenia is working on that in the issue. And mm -hmm. I saw some figure of, I think, 250 milliseconds just for the count for issues. Uh, but that's quite a big table, and that would be the longest 
like that would be the we would expect that to be the the highest mm -hmm. sure one quick thought might be that uh, we could we could cache uh, all the counts for the root group actually and invalidate the root group anytime is changed something in any descendant group so we we would invalidate often than necessary but we would have to keep only one cache uh, Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. We could probably measure like the ratio of hits to the sidebar versus the number of times we would have to invalidate the cache in each case and just go like with whichever one is the highest ratio because we're most likely to get the highest reward for that. Like it is true that we also have to take into account like private issues, confidential issues. So we might have to maintain like multiple caches or something. I'm not quite sure. And then there's also Russian doll cache caching, but I don't know if that's gone. <laughs> Maybe a bit out of fashion at this point, I'm not sure. Yeah, historically, one of the reasons why I think we didn't catch these uh, counts was that we historically uh, counted precise number. Uh, so we took into account the user's visibility of issues, but I think we don't do this anymore. And if we can ignore any permissions check, we can catch this on application level for everybody. Thanks. Um, so the issues there, like if, if anyone can contribute to it, even if we could get an idea of complexity, then that will help us get some of the work scheduled at least. And as Gabe said, like there's trade-off depending on what we want to do with simplifying groups and projects, but like ultimately, like whatever comes out of that group, we're probably going to have to solve some of these problems anyway. Um, like say we went down the route of always having, um, of every project having a parent group, an individual parent group, then we would have to solve this problem anyway for that case as well. So um, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I have the next item as well, uh, it's a quick one. As you know, like from the last couple of stage meetings, we have a test efficiency OKR. Um, we've actually met the original goal of that OKR, which is awesome given that it's only month one, probably means the OKR wasn't ambitious enough, but we couldn't possibly have known, right? Like. Um, Anyway, we have a pretty cool MR in progress, which will improve test efficiency across our factories by using something called um, parent strategy. Uh, I'm not gonna explain it, just basically if you're writing a test and you build a factory, sometimes it will create the, the parent factory. So if you build a project, it'll create a namespace, which is not necessary in most cases. We just want to also build the namespace so we can avoid database hits. Um, Peter cut the MR originally. There was a lot of pipeline failures. Those were fixed by Heinrich. There's now 40 odd commits in that MR. They need to be pulled out, reviewed individually before we can merge the mainstay of that MR. That's all. So all you have to do is cherry pick the commit site, get them through the review process. We can even consider them reviewed, just need maintainership review and get them through. And once we have them through, we can merge the mainstay of that MR. And time is a factor on this as well because new tests are being merged in as time goes on and we'll have to fix those as well before we merge the mainstay of that commit. So yeah, if you have spare time, please take a look at it because um, it should be like relatively little work just to nurse it through the review phase. And I have the next item as well. Uh, welcome to the John show. So uh, yeah, like we're also uh, discussing the possibility of splitting our monthly estimation by group this time. We've been through this a couple of times um, and the feedback has always been to keep it as a stage and to have, well, we've always had like one person from each backend group uh, as a DRI before we moved to continuous estimation. Now we're moving away from continuous and back to a monthly rotation. The feedback seems to be that engineers would like to actually split it by group. If you have a view on this, I've linked the MR. Um, please take a look at it and weigh in. Otherwise, I'm gonna assume that all the feedback is we wanna split it by group and I'm gonna work with Jake to actually do that in the handbook. Um, if you're curious as to why we want to move back to a monthly rotation, it's so that we can get PM's issues weighted by the 13th of the month so they have a better idea of what they have in terms of points to spend for the next milestone. 
Um, it'll never be perfect, but it's an attempt to improve on how things are going at the minute. You can check out, I've linked the product timeline there as well. So um, if we get this to a good place, we should have issues by the fourth and I'll be asking people on our side of the team to wait issues on the fourth. Um, and we aim to have them done well before the 13th uh, to give PMs a chance to, you know, figure out what they'd like to schedule. And that's it. We're on to metrics highlights, unless anyone has any questions. Yo, all right. Now, so um, I'm going to highlight two portfolio management kind of, uh, metric items. So we had four and a half percent growth in self managed instance adoption uh, from July to August. Uh, which is pretty great. So we passed the thousand self-managed reporting. Remember, we only get twenty about we only get self-managed data from about 27, 30% of the instances. So that number is lower than it is in reality, but that's what we have as a reporting number. Um, oh yeah, not self-managed customers, those are self-managed instances, apologies, which is a that's a that's a great milestone to pass. Um, we also had an all-time high uh, for epic creation on self-managed as well. We had 4,800 epics created in July. So that's great. Good work. Mark? Is there any difference between self-managed instances and self-managed customers with respect to Epics since they're paid anyway? Or what's the distinction there, Shiva? Well, I mean, I, customers can kind of be conflated with users at time. And so I just, instance is a little just more clear, you know, like an instance that has the usage on it. But Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, great news from uh, the certified area as well. Um, we have 181 reporting self-managed instances that are utilizing requirements management in August, which is up 24% from July, which is huge. Um, out of all of the self-managed instances reporting, only around 350 could use requirements management due to what version they are running. So about half of those who could are. Again, the reporting instances are a subset of actual instances, so it's kind of hard to extrapolate, but this is the best we have right now. Uh, there's also a 13% increase in number of requirements created by our self-managed customers, which is excellent. And then finally, we've seen a 24% growth in the number of projects created by paying instances for Service Desk. Now we saw a large spike in the number of instances using Service Desk on the whole when we moved it down from premium to starter or from ultimate to starter. Um, but the month after that move, we're still seeing a 24% increase, which is fantastic. So uh, we're seeing a lot more use, which is all great news. So thank you everyone for all your hard work. It's been, a, been noticed in the metrics, which is great. Uh, so I will report on what we know now. We don't have all of the data in yet because they're still the last week of August. It's getting processed. Um, the, should be done in the next seven to 14 days or something like that. Uh, but 35% self-managed Gmail improvement um, for, and those that's folks creating issues at this point. Uh, I think we have Heinrich is working on an issue to add more event tracking so that we can switch to that Gmail being based on uh, anyone who interacted with an issue like comment labels, created one, edited the description, that sort of thing. Um, and then the paid Gmail, uh, should be taken with a grain of salt. I continue to see this really weird trend. Right now, the data is telling me that we had a decrease at 200 mal, which would be only like, you know, a sixth of a percent. Um, but the thing that is interesting, and like I'll show this just so uh, folks can kind of reference where how, basically how flaky I think these metrics are. Um, this is like a table that shows you the total licensed instances and then those that have cust that have usage ping enabled. So like there's been this continued trend where like, you know, I think from six, seven, we lost, uh, we lost some instances for whatever reason, they just turned it off. We don't know yet. I'm still working with the data team to figure out how we can determine that. Um, but, and the usage ping like grew just a little bit, but then when we look at this month so far, we have basically, we grew the total number of licensed instances by 30%, but the overall pings enabled dropped by 25 down to only 28.9%. So what this is basically saying is, you know, 71.1% of our licensed users are not giving us any data. Um, so take it with a grain of salt <laughs> because all of the customers that I talked to that use plan don't have usage being enabled. So, uh, you know, it is what it is.
the other thing to note for all of our metrics that, that the PMs are presenting here is we don't know. It's not easy to know which 28% are reporting. Are they the large instances, the medium instances, or the small instances? So it gets very conflated if you're trying to figure out the number of users. If, you know, of those 28%, none of them are, are large enterprise type users, then we're really only representing a very, very small portion of our users. And, and there's no easy way for us to determine that. So we do the best with the data we have. And to Gabe's point, we found that most of the larger businesses are not enabling usage ping because their IT infrastructure generally prohibits it. So. Cool. Well, thanks for showing those. It's definitely, uh, even though the uh, data is kind of hard to uh, um, validate, I guess, it's still nice seeing those, uh, those numbers and those increases. Anyone have anything else? Cool. Well, we'll go ahead and call it. Everyone enjoy the rest of your week.